everyone, what's up? Back again with another episode of the weekly SEO. Today I am joined with James Gibbons. How has it been around the USA? Well, I'm used to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, interesting times, of course, but I'm, I'm based in the uh, New York City area. Mm -hmm. So the seasons are about to get into fall. So that's always a really great time in, in New York. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I can share your screen and we can start to flash these slides. Let's see what we have in our bucket. Cool. Uh, yes. So I'll just kind of give a, a bit of an intro um, on, on my background. So, you know, I did not study SEO at all in college. You know, lo literally had, had no idea I'd be doing this type of job. Um, but, you know, randomly landed into it. Um, I think I wanted to, you know, study for the LSAT with law school and then found this role, this company called lawyer.com, this entry level marketing role. And of course, at least in the US, you know, the legal marketing field is, is huge. You know, some of the highest CPCs are, you know, mesothelioma lawyer. I think it's like $500 a click. Um, and, you know, those could be multi million dollar cases. So that got me into the practice of SEO. And then from there, I wanted to learn more, went to several agencies. Hacker and Media, you know, a dedicated search marketing agency, um, then created my own um, consulting firm, targetedimpressions.com, um, and then went kind of to a larger, you know, full service digital agency, uh, Sapient Nitro, now Sapient Razorfish. Um, from there, you know, wanted a bit of a change of pace and even leaving New York City. So found this role down in Miami, had no idea about Skyscanner, but saw the job. Um, then immediately fell in love with the Skyscanner brand. Um, I was there for several years, uh, working on you know all of the websites for the Americas, you know U.S., Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, etc. Those were the top, at least. Um, and now working in the tooling space uh, at, at Quarter. Uh, so, kind of having going from you know first in-house and then spending time in agency. Then going back to in-house and now in the tooling space, you know, there's a lot of learnings that I would like to to share, and you know, also they all kind of, uh, you know, dovetail into kind of where we are in the industry. Um, so just some facts, you know, if I'm not thinking about SEO, um, I'm probably thinking about where I'm going to be traveling next. Um, and uh, yeah, there's no Zoom backgrounds here, but all the Zoom backgrounds that you see about travel pics, if you're in a Zoom with me, are all my own pictures. I also love guerrilla marketing. And you can see here, I took this photo in the cliffs of Moore in Ireland. Thank goodness it was a sunny day. But in the middle there, you, you can see that little sky scanner um, bumper sticker. So when I was traveling, I would literally always be having uh, my sky scanner stickers when there was an opportune moment. When you see multiple stickers, of course, uh, I would put. Uh, so I, there's like random ski areas in the Alps that have like sky scanner stickers. Anyway, so Where let's. Is that? that is the Cliffs of Moore in Ireland, on the west coast. All right. So if you, I find them, maybe I will take a photo too. All right. Uh, there is a scavenger hunt that is in the making of where all these things are be, because I do take pictures of uh, where I place them. All right. So we have uh, about 10 people here. Hey, everyone. I hope every, everyone is going well. Yep. So my name is Roman. Uh, this is not about me, but uh, I will say I'm director of SEO at Bustros. So I will left to the to James everything right now. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So wanted to just go through a couple kind of areas, you know, just break down some you know themes from agency life. You just like kind of top level pros and cons that, that I realized. And then within each one of these kind of some insights slash everybody likes a good growth hack. Um, and I was trying to find like a funny meme because there are some funny SEO memes. So I thought this was uh, you know, one of the main things, of course, is you can work with so many clients. Um, you're just rapid. You're in a rapid learning environment. So, you know, starting out, you know, I do think kind of the agency world is extremely valuable. 
um, and you can, you know, you're really specializing in the function of the craft. Um, however, you know, at the same time, um, you know, you may have a great recommendation and feel very passionate about it, but that may not be able to be implemented. And if it is implemented, maybe it's you know next year and you, you can't necessarily see things through. Um, and of course, uh, you know, sometimes there can be a lot of clients that you have to deal with. Um, and then there's billable hours, timesheets, uh, which does not necessarily add SEO value. Um, but you know, here are some of the clients that I have had the opportunity to engage with, you know, in like, I think less than like a two year period even. Um, and, you know, the breadth from doing like, you know, large e-commerce to, you know, travel to CPG, fashion brands, et cetera. So one of the things I want to talk about is, you know, especially when it comes to pitching and things of that nature, you know, you really, um, uh, you know, the, the innovation side can, can come out. Um, and we'll get to some other kind of factors about that, but this is an example, um, I do have to, you know, give credit to the official founder of this method. His name is Benjamin Royce. Uh, now he's at Google, um, but you know, I was hired there, and then he had to leave in about two weeks for another role, um, and so he left this kind of methodology um, and wanted to share this. And this was about kind of five, six years ago, um, before there was kind of NLP clustering kind of available for. Um, most people to, you know, entertain. So in this case, we have kind of a standard tree map and you can do this right in Google sheet, uh, in Google sheets, I believe. Um, then you can color code that by either the competition score or rank. Then you could do another grouping of kind of the keyword groups. And again, you know, historically this is a manual endeavor, but now we have NLP models to cluster this automatically. Then you can go one step further. I um, mean, this is kind of some white space in the industry, which is to be explored further. Um, but OK, we have our keyword data. How do we enrich this with social data? Um, you have what people are searching for, and then you have what people are talking about on social and content is the connector to that. So from these you know, keyword groups, keyword clusters, you can then extract social signals. How you do that, of course, depends. You know, maybe you can aggregate all the social tweets. Um, that can be uh, TBD. But then you could literally take that 2D version, render it in a 3D model. This, I think, was like a manual sketch, like a 3D sketch tool, and then literally be able to transform your graph in a 3D model and even 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 print it. So some cool things there um, upcoming potentially. Um, Another thing, network visualization is interesting, and this can be done uh, via a tool called uh, Um This is looking at, you know, just backlinks and how that relates different kind of backlink clusters. And again, you know, in a sales pitch type environment, this is really captivating um, in terms of, you know, not, this is not your average kind of thing that an agency may show necessarily, but it also works with, you um, keywords to landing pages, and then grouping in the whole competition, color coding each domain, then layering in where are all these content clusters and things of that nature. But again, you know, is it scalable? Um, this took a lot of time manually to do. Definitely. But of course, with technology being commoditized in certain areas, the opportunities are uh, going to be coming. So, so Yes. Sorry, Can I add, like, there might be someone who doesn't know what is keyword clustering, grouping, or something like that. So, would you like to introduce a little bit what it, does it mean, like keyword clustering, grouping? Yeah. So, natural um, or NLP is the acronym, natural language for processing. Um, but essentially, you can you know, and related to machine learning, you know, it is a subset under AI, you know, AI has many different veins. Um, and so essentially you can, uh, you know, look for similar patterns, you know, the, the computer, the, the technology can look for patterns in the language text and begin to group automatically. So if 
there's a lot of keywords about dogs and a lot of keywords about cats. You can, um, the, the computer knows how to immediately parse that. Yeah. And kind of, but th th there are more technical nuances that to, uh, to this, but at a top level, um, you know, it's also like you can identify, Hey, we have five business lines. We need to go through all of our keyword data and group them into five clusters. That's a bit easier than, um, Hey, we have all this raw data. Let's do it from scratch. There are use cases for that, but there are, you know, that's just kind of in it, you know, and then there's like supervised, unsupervised, you know, training data and things of that nature. But um, when you have a, a model that is built already and is available for use, you know, that's, you know, um, that allows you to kind of really propel ahead versus, hey, I'm going to create my own model from scratch. Mm -hmm. But we can get more on that uh, when we talk about quarter. Yeah. Um, that's my so then jumping into in-house, uh, and again, you know, Skyscanner was a really great experience. Um, and so, you know, for the pros, you can literally see things through from like your own idea or your own team kind of coming up with an idea to all sh having it shipped live, having it generate revenue for the company, uh, et cetera. And you really kind of get very close to kind of the product itself, you know, learning more about you know, how the product is interacting with the channel. Also kind of broadening your skill set beyond just SEO, you know, how does paid interplay? How does email interplay? CRO, et cetera. Um, and of course, having one site that you're working on, or at least a couple, but if the, in, um, the same North Star metrics versus an agency life, you have B2B lead gen, you have e-commerce sales, you have you know local business calls. Navigating back and forth can be confusing um, versus kind of a st single set of metrics that are unified across any type of activity within the organization. And a key piece of learning that was important was the um, pirate metrics. They have an R, you know, for a, a pirate. But, um, and they, you know, I like how they put awareness first but uh, awareness, activate, or acquisition, um, activation, retention, revenue, referral. And when you think about kind of your, your marketing system across these different dimensions, you know, there's growth levers in each of these. You know, if you have this huge awareness campaign, that will probably get people coming to the site. If you have a good CRO, you'll, you'll make sure that your site is activating. And that's not necessarily selling first. You need to track that kind of top level engagement before they even add something to the cart. You know, are they scrolling to the bottom? Um, in the case of Skyscanner, it was, you know, are they actually interacting with the search uh, search box and calculating, okay, they actually interacted. So that showed an initial activation moment. Um, and of course, you know, Skyscanner was growing like crazy, you know, 100%, 200% year on year was the norm. Um, and then, you know, maintaining those growth rates is as high as possible um, in kind of that framework. And, you know, the cons, you know, sometimes you can get a bit more distant from the practice of SEO. And you're like, wait, I'm doing all this other stuff. I, I'm forgetting the day to day, um, you know, following the latest trends. Um, and sometimes, you know, just bringing your ideas forward and pushing them through a large organization, that's a skill in and of itself. Um, so another kind of key concept that you know, is really important for, for in-house, um, and you could also apply this to SEO tactics as well, is, you know, and this comes from McKinsey, a very tried and true model. Um, you know, there's three horizons of, of growth. And, you know, think about almost, um, you know, 70% of your time horizon one, 20% horizon two, 10% horizon three. And kind of from a tactical perspective, that title tag example is obviously like the most, the quickest win of Horizon One. When I first started at Skyscanner for the US site, they had that default string for their flights too. And then I realized they had this dynamic placeholder value. So I immediately went in and, you know, updated all, you know, the template for the flights to flights to this um, airport pages. Um, and boom, that was obviously, you know, immediate impact, like double the click through rate immediately. And that was like 2016. Um, but so, you know, 
horizon one is these are things that have a material impact on the business right now. But what got you here is not going to get you to your next kind of goal. So you need to have kind of emerging opportunities. These are maybe, you know, SEO tests that you're thinking about. Um, you're not really sure. You're following kind of a case study from another, uh, you know, from thought leadership, another uh, company. You're, you're testing something out to potentially, you know, productionize it and make it kind of a horizon one kind of core business activity, core authorization tactic. Then you have horizon three, which I love to spend time in. Um, these are things, there's no case study at all for, for these. These are brand new things. Um, you know, the case studies will be written about. Um, and, you know, these things, you know, if you can nail, you know, get have that kind of pipeline going and, you know, and know how to divide the time, um, there's a lot of uh, opportunities there. And so um, kind of one kind of growth hack thing um, that was probably one of my gr greatest kind of success from an immediate business standpoint um, was kind of there was like no Black Friday, Cyber Monday campaign pages um, upcoming. So, OK, I'm like, we we should work with the freelancers to crank some out. Mm -hmm. um, and initially and this is just for the single Cyber Monday page, uh, this graph. On the first year, we literally ranked number one for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Black Friday flights, Cyber Monday flights, wow. um, without any backlinks because we were first and nobody else had that clear targeting. Um, and of course, our do the skyscanner.com domain did have a minimum threshold that it could rank rather quickly with kind of blog articles. So that is a requirement, of course. You, know, you, you can't just have a brand new site, right? Um, but you can see every year it got bigger. Uh, of course, we kept the URL um, and we kept expanding the scope of the uh, landing pages. So first it was just kind of two Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Next year it was like, OK, Black Friday hotels, Cyber Monday hotels, maybe a couple airlines. Then the third year we went all out, you know, like you know, probably 30 airline pages. Then even and this is kind of Horizon 3 type stuff, you know, Skyscanner is also an advertising platform. So um we had actual uh you know clients ad clients paying for the content on these pages uh to kind of own the you know sp sponsored content essentially which was literally you know paying for the content itself you know this is a concept called adjacent uh, abundance you know if you don't have resources yourself in your network there are resources um mm -hmm. so yeah you know there have been some structural changes over at skyscanner and i think they deleted some of these pages but anyway um so what's next in tools um and so this is you know, what now where i'm at you know i've seen a lot of tools over the years working at agencies and um in-house uh, you're dealing with you know vendors and hearing pitches and things of that nature so when i came across quarter i was immediately impressed um, you know saw the vision and where it's going and so just to give some background as well, you know, these are kind of things that are kind of already here and kind of the pace of change may start to pick up um, faster, I'd say. So, of course, we have, you know, AI. And like I said, you know, there's several subsets and these are just kind of the three three main subsets kind of most relevant in AI. It's, you know, the machine learning, you know, if you have a goal, you can train a model to identify things that lead to that goal, a, a predictive model. So for example, um, what, you know, how can we predict this gets to page one? Well, if we look at enough data sets and, you know, time series analysis of the ranks plus backlink evolution, we may be able to have an algorithm that says, hey, this page, three weeks after launch, it'll probably get to page one. Those are some cool areas. Um, natural language processing that's kind of the tagging etc then you have natural language generation uh, this is kind of related to gpt3 now they're coming out of gpt4 um there, and there's other models but okay given an input text can there be an output text literally writing uh content so that can be controversial um but there are some data to show that it does work but there is a missing layer excuse me um the factual component um, right now, it is more of a kind of auto-suggest type feature, 
but there, you know, the models need to be, you know, customized to incorporate like the editorial factual component. You know, those are just some gaps. Then we have kind of big data in cloud, you know, um, just there's just so much data. Cloud technology kind of makes that easier to kind of, you know, move and things of that nature. And so that's you know something to keep in mind. Then, of course, we have automation. Um, a lot of processes you know, don't need to be led by you know humans that that should be reserved for the created the creativity the you know things that people know how to do best you know coming up with a really cool campaign concept really cool content um that takes that creative element versus okay we have to look for all the errors do an audit manually etc um then we have kind of the commoditization of technology um, and I think within the SEO industry, this is manifesting specifically with rank tracking. Um, you know, rank tracking used to be like, you know, the thing. I'm, I'm probably generalizing a bit, but, you know, nowadays that technology, you know, it's available for anybody. You know, it's not like it's that proprietary, just rank tracking itself. Um, so it's like, okay, if this gets so expendable, like anybody can just do rank tracking, then what does that mean for all the rank tracking providers? An inflection point. So, you know, we're in this point again, post, you know, not post, but getting through COVID, the whole business environment is changing with this technology changing. So we are at an inflection point, you know, like back to the uh, three horizons of, of growth, you know, there's always that kind of initial, I'm trying to um, do the opposite signal, but, you know, things are going up and then they go down a bit b b before there's that next kind of spike up in terms of the productivity and total growth. And then another kind of point is, you know, SEO, it's more than just SEO, actually. <laughs> um, for the yeah. Google, I mean, for the users, they sometimes have no idea if they're clicking on paid or organic. Yet, a lot of times it's defined very dogmatically, um, SEO or paid when kind of having a full model of how Google is actually working probably has a bit more business value. And then beyond that, you know, SEO, email marketing, offline, everything kind of, you know, should be shifting kind of the total business value, total opportunity versus just SEO. So getting into quarter, um, you know, essentially we want to, you know, be, you know, the unified platform to connect, you know, all of these disparate systems with kind of a unified AI uh, model. Um, so, you know, we're pulling in all of your Google search console, all of your Google ads via API every day, mm -hmm. running all of the NLP modeling. So you never have to do manual keyword grouping. And then pulling in all of your, your web behavior data via GA or Adobe or any other analytics mm -hmm. platform layering on joining that via the url so now all of your data is immediately unified um and bringing in those behavioral metrics to the keywords of course looking at kind of bot signals and crawling then kind of outputting into business intelligence systems or inputting any other ad hoc type of uh, data stream and then we need that are kind of the proprietary modeling uh and signals that we are uh doing, which is kind of all of our content alignment scoring, all of the market share um, across the competition, and of course, running Lighthouse at scale across you know, your website and the competitors who are actually competing with you. So um, yeah, I have this dense slide here, but um, wow. some, talking, uh, some talking points, you know, I, I mentioned uh, you know, joining all of the data daily market share. So basically not just, you know, the keywords identified are programmatically. So what is the best representative sample from GSC, but also what you're bidding on via, via ads to play back in Google every day and to calculate market share. Um, and then, you know, from those sites that are competing with you at the keyword cluster level, and I'll explain uh, what that means shortly, we're literally crawling those sites, finding the content signals on that. Um, so you know exactly what you're working with, what are the factors in play. And literally, you can see the whole opportunity 
in one view. Um, and then most importantly, we have a sandbox environment where you can literally test out changes and see if these have a material impact on the NLP scoring of um, the uh, content element. And this is not just keyword and title. This is looking at an NLP model, which also includes the rank changes from the learning that's happening. And of course, we're built for just a huge scale as well. So here's what I meant in terms of the kind of top level ranking factors table. So here we can see this is some dummy data, but let's say you have kind of a certain section of the site or a certain landing page. You can look at a table like this and see, okay, keyword emphasis is rather strong, but we see you know a big player here, but you can also break that down further in terms of metadata, structured data, headings, image alt text, body, link anchor text to see kind of what is the gap across each specific content element. And then of course we have performance and this would be kind of an immediate flag that there is a performance issue. Then we can break that down further and see, you know, what are the different um, core web vitals uh, audits uh, specifically. Again, these are the sites that you're actually competing with for that keyword space. Mm -hmm. on that, you know, that could be in your, you obviously have maybe hundreds, thousands of, of keyword spaces per, per site. Then kind of, okay, how do we deal with performance issues? So like I said, you know, we're crawling the entire site, a representative sample. You know, if you do have the same template, you know, we don't need to scan every page in that similar template, we, we can do a sampling. Um, and then aggregating it at the issue level, not at the page level. So if you have, you know, a, a site with, you know, 300,000 pages or a million pages, you obviously can't put each URL in, like if, if you put each URL into PageSpeed Insights manually, you're not going to get the whole picture. So here we have each ranked item list. This specific issue is affecting, you know, 1500 milliseconds across uh, about 105 pages, this much traffic. This one is impacting, you know, almost half of the site. So now, you know, you're literally having this backlog of core items that will immediately address core revitals as fast as possible and other performance issues. Okay. Then we have you know, probably one of my favorite um, parts in our content recommendations view. This is looking yep. at a specific page. And here we're, all, you know, about 100,000 impressions in a 30 day period. And we're literally clustering all of these top these micro intents because we have mm -hmm. our top level keyword clustering for like the the full you know um site then on a page level we're breaking things down so literally you know there's 54 different ways that people have been searching for a, a, a marina weight gain with that type of you know total metric and or total impact and so we have what's called the keyword importance this is how important it is in the market overall because when we scrape the competitor sites, we see it, look at the volume. Then, you know, what is uh, the brand's emphasis towards that? You know, are they really strong? Uh, and then emphasis rank is literally looking at, okay, how targeted are you amongst the top sites? So in this case, you know, there are other sites that are more targeted, have a stronger emphasis. So this would let you know that, hey, you know, there's still more we can do from a content perspective. And again, this is not using, you know, other tools, you may see kind of similar things with a kind of like a rainbow pattern, things of that nature. This is actually using your GSC data. You're creating your own models here. And, and, and that's just kind of a key thing that I wanted to highlight. Um, and then this is the sandbox environment. So literally across any page element, meta headings, anchor text, and even the body as well, you can scroll down, you can literally toggle between not only your site, but these are the competing sites with you for this keyword cluster. And then you can see the keyword alignment, but also the market share. So you know like how much traffic are they actually getting versus the alignment? Because obviously there's the brand bias and things of that nature. So you have to kind of look at too. And then literally you can, you can update or add new and it will score immediately to let you know, is this optimization actually going to have an impact? And these are yeah. similar, you know, our data science teams, we look at Google's patents, we've studied the informational retrieval technology and modeled out kind of that. These are similar scoring patterns that 
and Google has to make that decision instantly. How is it recalibrating? We can get some guidance from a content perspective through this. Um, and you can see here, you know, this, these titles from the competitor are rather high. And notice how we, we, we put these not in, in the order of the relevancy. So, you know, yes, we're going to have, and also I, I didn't show, when you click this, there's a recommendations module where we are providing you recommendations. Um, but uh -huh. also you can copy variations of what the competitors are, are doing. So, hey, you know, their you know, this title is this way. Theirs was this way. So there are potentially some nuances we can incorporate. And again, you don't have to leave the platform or go on the competitor's site to give them a, a boost or, or Google you know, that, that type of thing and then click on that thing. So I, I think that is a nice thing as well. Um, and yeah, also wanted to say, um, so that this experience here um, and this, uh, we can test out with your a GSC export. Um, so do go um, here and we'd love to um, show you, uh, let you trial out kind of a clustering model for your own um, content. And that was about all I had. Wow. Amazing tool. And the best part, I guess, is keyword clustering and keyword importance. Like uh, there is keyword difficulty in a lot of tools, like based on compass tools, based on a lot of metrics. But this one, it's a little bit like impressive because you have a lot of metrics, uh, which is, I guess, is important. Uh, we don't have any questions, by the way, James, but I would like to ask you one and only question because we are out of our time. In your opinion, why do you think your clustering is important for ACO? Well, it just, again, removes the manual effort and allows you to place that where it has the, the highest impact. You know, people yeah. should not be going in and looking at URLs, URL contains, etc. cetera. Um, they should be thinking about, okay, what is amazing content we can create? How do we connect our marketing efforts with other channels? How can we do things that, um, you know, in, in, in new ways that have never been done before, ultimately? Mm -hmm. And there's that principle of, you know, 80-20 Pareto principle, you know, 80% um, of the impact comes from 20% of the effort. And so, you know, with a platform like Quarter, we are kind of you know squeezing that orange to get as much use as possible to even tilt that equation more. So you know maybe ten percent of the or it's yeah. So that type of model of like always being laser focused on what is the most high impact items to be working on, which don't even require analysis because our recommendation engine is pushing that to you. So it's like yes, you can go in and look at your top pages and things like that, but, or you can look at the aggregation output doing like your own, you know, I'm sure everybody's downloaded a, a export from Ahrefs, done a, a pivot table to the yeah. URL sort by, you know, total search volume aggregate keyword. That's an automated process now. And you can view that output. Okay. These are the most important pages we need to look at. I don't need to even do the analysis to find that. So how long does that analysis normally take? Well, now that's yeah. moot. I guess this tool it will be the result of losing a job. I don't know. It's because of NLP. <laughs> All well, right. No, it's uh, just thing. Things are just going to shift a bit, and and that's what you know. Definitely. That's just the way technology works sometimes. Couldn't agree more. Uh, we have a question. All right, <laughs> but you can answer it shortly if you want. Uh, what was your most challenging work experience, agency or in-house? <laughs> um, yeah, good question, I guess. I'd, it's, 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 uh, there's different dimensions to it. I mean, in terms of like, you know, burnout, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe a bit more agency, but when, you know, in-house, you really need to kind of, when you have an idea, you really have to kind of have all sides of it looked at you and being able to carry it through. So that, you know, does take a learning curve um, versus, hey, I have this great idea. Let's work on it. Well, no, like mm -hmm. your idea is going to be attacked from many different 
critique angles. Um, yeah. So getting in the habit of just doing that yourself can, you know, it's an adjustment. All right. Uh, we have a link here if you want to test this tool, if you want to test Quarter. Here's the link, bustrazatstudio slash quarter. So we'll share it also, the deck on the description section. Also, we have a newsletter, if you can show it, James. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, if you want our weekly SEO news delivered to your inbox, you just need to enter this uh, link to your search bar and you will get a button there, click there and subscribe to our weekly SEO. All right, uh, I guess that's it. Our final okay. slide is the next one. Thank you very much, James, for your presentation. Uh, it's Thank you. Really it was a lot of fun. Useful. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming to the weekly SEO. You are out of this world and bye-bye until the next Take care. SEO.